All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started and people will probably still trickle in. Um, thank you everyone for so much for coming to today's seminar. For those who don't know me, I'm Shelby. I'm a postdoc in the Fisheries and Conservation Biology Lab uh, and the Ichthyology Lab. Um, and I'm very excited to host our seminar speaker today, Dr. Sean Hayes. Um, but before we jump into the seminar, I quickly wanna go over some Zoom etiquette. Um, so all the entire audience um, will be muted throughout the seminar. Uh, please do not attempt to turn on your video or share your screen during the talk. Um, there will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions at the end of the talk, just like a normal seminar. Uh, once the speaker has finished, their talk, you can use the Zoom raise hand feature to notify them, um, me that you'd like to ask a question. Uh, the raise hand feature is located under the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, you're invited to turn on your video during the questions portion of the talk. Um, so now that we've covered that, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Sean Hayes from the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, Dr. Hayes is originally from upstate New York and received undergraduate degrees from SUNY Cobosco and Cornell. Um, for his PhD, he moved across the country to our neck of the woods, receiving a degree from UC Santa Cruz in marine mammal physiology and behavior. Um, and even though this is a virtual seminar, it's a bit of a homecoming for Dr. Hayes. While he was at UCSC, he spent much of his time at Moss Landing. Uh, Jim Harvey was on his thesis committee, and he did all the field work for his thesis with Moss Landing students, facilities, and boats, and was treated like an honorary student. Um, after years in academia, Dr. Hayes moved into civil service, working for the National Marine Fisheries Service. He moved all over the country, working on a variety of uh, species and ecological challenge faced by marine resources. Uh, Dr. Hayes is currently the Protected Species Branch Chief at the NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Woods Hole, and today he will be presenting his work on North Atlantic right whales, documenting the extinction with precision or saving the ecosystem. Um, and with that, you can take it away. All right. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's um, a real honor to be here. And as Shelby said, it was, um, I just like to, I spent a lot of time at Moss Landing and it's, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the generosity and camaraderie and kindness that everyone showed me there so many years ago. It's, it was really questionable whether I would have survived grad school without having been kind of taken in. Um, so, um, I would like to speak to you about some of the efforts I've had the privilege to be part of. Um, most of what I'm talking about today won't actually be my work, but it's some things I've had fingers in and, and engaged in. Um, but um, so I'll talk about kind of a sort of a hardcore right whale NOAA project and, and management topic. And then I've been thinking about, I've worked on protected species in the agency now for I guess 20 years. and and have been kind of developing some more lofty or whimsical thoughts. And, and I'm gonna experiment on you guys as tonight's probably gonna be the first night I've really had the courage to kind of raise these ideas in a seminar before. So, so bear with me as we move through that. And let's see if the advancements is gonna work here. So pictured here is a North Atlantic right whale um, along with her calf. This is right whale catalog number 3180, but she was named Dragon. And this is her calf in 2008. Dragon is a baleen whale. And for this species, we are able to identify unique individuals within the population through the unique patterns of callosities on the dorsal part of their forehead circled in this image. North Atlantic right whales are one of NIMPS's species in the spotlight. And what this emphasizes as a species that is in trouble, but we've really doubled down on efforts to ensure their recovery. And it's the story of those efforts that I really wanna share with you today. Dragon is one of an estimated number of 368 animals known to be alive at the beginning of 2019. We update this population number annually, along with all of the other statistics. There's about a two year lag in the assessment from real time. Uh, it takes um, a year to collect the data and then a year to analyze it. Um, so that gives us, brings us to the present. In February of 2020, Dragon swam into our local waters near Cape Cod, emaciated, scarred, and, and likely on the verge of death. The cause, a piece of fishing gear, a buoy line basically is caught in her mouth. We don't know how severe, it's likely preventing her from being able to eat 
and it's possible she's not possible. It very much is the case. She's been slowly starving to death for months. This was the beginning of the COVID-19 ep epidemic and in February of 2020, and we've not seen her since, and we're confident that she is dead. We're confident she's dead because we know almost every animal in the population and recite 90% of all of the individuals every single year. Pictured here are the survey track lines from multiple institutions of the collective survey effort that has just happened since April 1 of this year to give you a sense of the scale of effort that happens on right whales. Sightings are tracked near real time on this website known as Whale Map and the websites there. If you're curious on it, there's other species as well. These are all of the confirmed right whale sightings along the Eastern seaboard just in 2021 and sightings are updated typically within 24 hours of a confirmed sighting. Any sighting that is a confirmed individual identification is fed into a Bayesian state-based mark and recapture model that gives us the ability to estimate the population size with a 95% credible interval of plus or minus about 11 animals every single year. And then just turning that ability to estimate every single the, the population abundance with such precision every year, we're basically able to do the algebraic flip of your, your standard population um, abundance as a function, function of deaths and births. And by that, we're actually able to estimate deaths every year now, even when we don't see them. Um, and so essentially, you know, we can flip that model and, and get what we're, we call a, a total mortality, annual mortality for the population. We often refer to it inadvertently or as cryptic because it's, it's more than just the carcasses that we see. We are now estimating the total missing amount of the population. Um, this is a very clinical way of quantifying mortality in one of our best known study species. Dealing with the causes of those deaths is, is far more complicated. The right whale, as it was called by Nantucket whalers for it was the right whale to kill um, because it is so close to shore, it's slow swimming and floated after being killed has had other names that relate to its long history of challenges with humans. It's also been called the urban whale for similar reasons that it was very susceptible to impact by many of our, our modern marine activities. Ship strike and commercial fishing are the two primary causes of mortality that we know about and are so effective at, at killing these animals that the mean age of the population is only about 35, which is unusual for a Belenidae. And in almost 20 years of necropsies, we have yet to confirm death by a natural cause for a mature animal. The issue of sublethal mortality and stress are also creating additional problems um, manifested as poor body condition and low calving rates. Right whales have the sad distinction of having had the highest cortisol level ever measured in a mammal, um, which is a stress hormone, and also a sad but elegant experiment because one of the, these are, I've been talking about, you know, immediate mortality stressors, but one of the other things we deal with across the marine mammal environment is noise, but that's one that's very hard to sort of quantify the impacts of, but it's somewhat ironic that it's anniversary week of 9-11. Roll and Adele were able to take advantage of the sudden silence that happened in the ocean at 9-11 to collect stress hormones on right whales during a period of unusual silence and were able to document a dramatic drop in hormones before and after um, stress hormones as a function of just the incredible quietness that was in the ocean during that window. Um, despite this, all these challenges from 1990 to around 2010, the species had been in a period of fairly stable, although slow recovery. Things leveled out a few after, years after that, and then things got worse. And this is where I'm gonna find out if my video actually plays. No! So this is a, uh, it might go here, but um, in either case, um, what is supposed to happen here is an increasing trend of, of warming and we'll give it a chance here to go. Um, 
But basically, Dragon used to spend much of her time feeding in the Gulf of Maine. Climate change resulted in a steady warming of the world's oceans for decades now. However, not all regions are warming at the same pace. And the Gulf of Maine in 2010 departed from this curve and started warming much faster than other parts of the ocean to the point where it's in the top 1% of fastest warming ocean bodies on the planet. Sorry, I'm struggling with mouse between two monitors. As a result, Dragon and her siblings um, are using historical areas less frequently. And so is blacking out on here and, if, and are traveling to new places in search of food, um, which their primary food are calanoid copepods. In particular, this species is now regularly seen foraging in the summertime in the Canadian Maritimes where until a few years ago, very few management protections existed. The consequence of this is that they are both traveling farther and encountering new risks, including many more vessels. At the same time, new opportunities for lobster and crab fishing are emerging in our own fleets and our own fleets are, are moving to fish in places that increase the risk for these whales as well. In June of 2017, after two years in my new job, I was preparing to fly back to California to help my girlfriend and now wife move east. I had received an alarming number of reports from our aerial survey crew who were exploring new right whale habitat use in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And after several concerning reports, I found myself composing an email on a Sunday morning to the agency's senior leadership in Silver Spring, Silver Spring where I wrote, at this point, we've lost 1.5% of the population in a little over a week. And we don't know if this is a blip or the problem is accelerating. As things unveiled over the next few weeks, the death toll ultimately reached 17 in terms of observed animals dead. And one person was lost trying to disentangle an animal as well. Having analyzed more data through our cryptic mortality methodology that we've established in the last two years, we now put that year's total mortality at around 42 animals, um, just under 10% of the entire population. 2017 was the worst year on record, um, and both the US and Canadian governments have been doing a great deal to reverse this trend that sadly still continues. But the trend is more complicated than just mortality. You'll notice the bar graph at the bottom of this infographic, um, and that is the number of calves that have been born each year in the population. And it's been down. A colleague of mine, Peter Corcoran, repeatedly made this concept as we were people were focusing on all the deaths in the right whales um, and we were beginning to realize that calving rate was down too and it's really very simple demogra demography as it's put here if more animals are dying a year than are born um, then a species will decline and unfortunately right whales have been taking it in the chin from both directions um, as the decline also coincided with a significant drop in calving rates, this suggested more challenges were afoot. While we suspected climate change and food availability were playing a role, work by New England Aquarium, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and NIMS were unveiling a secondary consequence of non-lethal entanglement. On average, 30% of the population suffers some recognizable form of entanglement injury every single year. This means that an individual, individual basically has a 70% chance of not getting entangled. When you multiply that throughout time, you see that within a few years, every animal in the population will be entangled. Right whales are capital breeders and work by Vanderhoop et al. shows that the cost of entanglement, even when survival, even when survived can be very expensive to the point of being even more expensive than pregnancy. And in this species, the ability to get pregnant has been shown to be a function of body condition. Currently, the mean calving interval for North Atlantic right whales is close to eight years, which means that a female has a 7% chance of not getting entangled between calves. In all likelihood, most females do experience this challenge between calves and it probably resets the clock on how soon they can reacquire enough resources to once again get pregnant. So, Instead of living 80 years and potentially having 15 to 20 calves, females in this population are living on average 35 years and are lucky to have three. My story focuses heavily on entanglement, but I should take a moment to observe an equally serious threat, that of ship and vessel strikes. 
we are currently trying to resolve how best to apportion the unseen mortalities um, in this population by cause. And the deeper we dive into this question, the more concern we have about the impact of vessel strikes, both observed and unobserved in this species. Similar to entanglement, we mechanistically understand the problem and what needs to be done, but the solution is very difficult to manage from an economic perspective. Statistically, it's clear whales are more able to avoid ship strikes by slower moving vessels than they are by fast moving vessels. However, it is no easier to tell people to stop fishing in New England than it is to ask the entire global supply chain to simply slow down. Given all of this, one might think recovery is hopeless, but there are scenarios um, in other parts of the world that give hope. One can imagine what right whale populations might look like after decades of recovery, um, where they have not aged long enough to die, have don't experience ship strike or entanglement, they're fat and happy, and calving rates are on the order of five to 7% and the populations are giving birth to hundreds per year. That's exactly the case of what's happening in all three populations of Southern right whales right now where because of the low human population density in the Southern hemisphere, there's very few ship strikes or they essentially go unobserved, no evidence of entanglement. The calving cycle is what we would expect for the species every four years, as opposed to what we're seeing on seven to 10 for North Atlantic. There's no mortality in adult whales. Since the end of whaling in the mid 1900s, they essentially haven't lived long enough to actually start dying of natural causes compared to our northern hemisphere species, which are dying by the age of 35. So how do we save North Atlantic right whales? Um, a more entertaining and, and sort of, and I don't mean that in a comical way, but just better presentation than I could ever do justice to tonight. Um, for if you're interested in the story, I highly recommend the, the documentary video Entangled by David Abel, and you can just um, Google entangledfilm.com for uh, a good play out of all the people that I deal with on a regular basis um, to address this problem. But it requires policy engagement, um, litigation. We're regularly sued on both sides, and I work with I have seven, as a scientist, it's unusual to even know a lawyer, but there's seven lawyers that I work with on a regular basis um, dealing with the right whale issue. Um, there's science support, um, which is the, the role I and my team at Northeast Center play, and then outreach and innovation. The Atlantic large take reduction, large whale take reduction team is one of several take reduction teams established under the Marine Mammal Protection Act as policy to help develop plans to mitigate the risk to marine mammals posed by fishing gear when a certain amount of mortality appears in any given species. NIMS established this particular team in 1996 and it is composed of fishermen, scientists, conservationists, and state and federal officials from Maine to Florida. The team attempts to mitigate risk by coming, by coming up with consensus-based decisions um, that should be management solutions. But with more than 50 voices, this is difficult. This is a room full of passion, dedication, and fear for everything from the extinction of a species to the loss of people's livelihoods and our coastal fishing communities and economies. As my colleague Mike Acero regularly says, in this situation, we're not really managing whales, what we're managing are people. In 2018, we really changed our approach in how we support this team as an agency. Historically, our science contribution was to show up with a new whale population estimate, a report of all the dead animals that might have been seen, and basically ask the team to find more solutions. Several changes, however, were made. For my part, I walked across the courtyard of our science center and asked our lobster biologist, a person named Burton Shank, for help, thus bringing a degree of fisheries expertise that we had previously lacked on the team. Burton may be the most modest person one could ever meet, and he's also one of the most functionally brilliant colleagues I've ever had. Together with other colleagues and NIMS, we built a plan for qualifying quantifying both the existing risk in the environment, as well as evaluating the potential tools by which we might reduce that risk. Then we built a support team around Burton to build a software model to quantify all of this. Once that tool was built, 
We gave the software to the team as well as a target of how much risk they needed to remove from the environment. Quantifying risk in the marine environment or any environment is tricky. Um, even in a simple cartoon like this, where one species, where you're dealing with just one species and, and one gear type, when you start factoring in the seasonality of habitat use, as well as the multiple gear types that also fluctuate in their density in the, throughout the year, it gets very complicated. To make matters worse, every stakeholder had a different idea of how, to, how they wanted to go about mitigating the risk and as well as compare the relative benefits of each was very complicated. Um, and literally we were in an apples and oranges scenario. So what is, what is the benefit of a closure versus reducing effort somewhat to um, when you wanna compare that to something like changing the gear to using lighter ropes or, or having some sort of time tension line cutter in the event an entanglement happens versus sort of an ultimate solution, which is um, going to booless or ropeless fishing technologies. Risk is generally a, a function of the likelihood of an event to occur that occurs multiplied by the severity of that event if it does occur. For likelihood, we developed two spatial layers. First, one was a line density um, spatial layer that went into a habitat map, essentially. Um, first, we Burton built using this from data taken from the fishery, as well as a partially developed layer for, developed by an outside consultant. And then second, we used a right whale habitat model that had been developed by Jason Roberts and his team at Duke University. And then together created a, a co-occurrence layer of where's the density of whales versus where's the density of gear, um, both seasonally and spatially. Then using a concept developed by Nick Farmer, um, we, we took this section a little bit further and then added a severity layer as well. So I'm sorry, I'm stumbling on my notes here. Um, Nick had basically developed an idea of relative risk units. Um, and so we took all three elements of this where we made risk a function of whale density in an area at a given time, as well as gear density in a given time. And then as I was stumbling to say, we developed a, a severity or a threat model because the gear types um, varied in their nature. So we didn't wanna call you know, a, a quarter inch vertical line connected to one lobster trap in 30 meters of water just off the beach, um, assign that the same risk as something that might align that might be in 300 fathoms of water with 50 lobster traps connected to it and the line had a breaking strength of 6,000 pounds. And so we worked with the TRT members to rank the relative risk of a range of gear types as well as to rank um, the potential benefit of a series of, of risk decrease scenarios as well that we all built it, added into the threat model. This then allowed us to basically create graphical layers of risk in the environment on a monthly basis um, for the New England waters. And it's summarized here in, in this graphic with essentially a, a logarithmic heat map where all the layers are together. And then essentially um, for each of the months we created, you know, there was a, a monthly value of risk generated for each month. And then that was accumulated, added across the year. And then what we did was we gave the team a target. So if there were essentially 7 million risk units, we gave them a target and said, you have to reduce risk in this environment be somewhere between 60 and 80% of the current level. Um, and then, and told them to go to work and they did. It took a long time, um, but just two weeks ago, um, after, as this title says, after years of delay, federal regulators issue sweeping fishing rules to protect right whales. Um, they came to a solution that reduced roughly 60% of the risk in the marine environment um, from the lobster fishery. We are moving on. There's a lot more to do to, there's other fisheries out there and we're concerned that we still haven't actually met the target for what is actually going to be necessary to achieve right whale conservation based on new insights of, of mortality levels since that initial target was provided to the take reduction team. To that end, following the wisdom of, of Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. In the fall of 2017, several colleagues 
and I decided the time for developing the concept of ropeless fishing had arrived. NIMS had actually started research on this in the mid 90s, but concluded that the gear conflict issue um, was too complex to deal address with the current technology. And this combined with New England cultural abhorrence to change in general, the idea of ropeless fishing was shelved at the time. However, since 2017, as I say, we've gone full tilt on, on making ropeless fishing a reality and not just a, a science fiction future. I should spend a second on what we mean by that. The definition is in reference to the idea of fishing with methods that no longer have a vertical line connecting the surface buoy to gear on the bottom. By eliminating the use of rope in the water column, we minimize the risk of entanglement to large whales, turtles, and other marine vertebrates. The technology is focused on trap fisheries, but we are also already adapting it to gillnet fisheries and even aquaculture as well. Trawls of traps, which is how lobstermen fish in Maine, essentially multiple, often dozens of daisy lobster traps, daisy train, chain, daisy chain together by ground lines across the seafloor and nets would still have ground line connectors and head ropes in the case of gill nets. But the vertical line um, connecting the rope to this surface would be removed. Um, because there's still some rope involved, there's some debate about the appropriateness of this term ropeless and, but ropeless, buoyless and on demand are all used. However, the majority of stakeholders generally use the term ropeless. A fully developed ropeless system is envisioned to rely on acoustic communication systems, both for initiating the recall of the system to the surface and detecting the presence, its presence on the seafloor by passing vessels. Several forms of the technologies that are, we're currently testing are pictured here, and they range from um, what is called a, a pop-up buoy, where essentially we send a release signal to the, the trap, and then a device releases the lid of the trap, and then the coil of rope inside the trap is allowed to essentially coil out as the buoys float to the surface. Alternatively, we are working with a couple of prototypes that make use of inflatable lift bag. Um, basically, you send a signal to the trap, compressor, pressurized gear, gear in the canister is released, inflates the bag, and the first trap, which isn't actually fishing, floats back to the surface. And then the third device is essentially a, a coiled spool, which then um, frees itself to spark, start uncoiling and um, return to the surface as well, all our signals. If there's time, I'm happy to show videos of these devices at the end of the talk. I have an entire talk dedicated to the challenges of developing ropeless fishing in the marine environment, and these range from economic to policy to human behavior to law enforcement. But for this talk, we'll just overview our efforts to resolve the challenges of physics. The first is buoyancy, which is just that of getting the gear back to the surface. Um, the reality is the oceanographic community has been doing this fairly regularly, as well as the U.S. Navy, um, since the 70s. And, and it's more of teaching the fishermen, um, figuring how to sort of integrate this technology into um, a lobster trap, since that's the form of gear they're used to sort of deploying off the back deck, as well as recovering, as well as getting the gear up to the rigors of being deployed, you know, continuously at sea for months on end. The harder challenge, which is what led to the suspension of our efforts decades ago, is that of gear conflict, um, which is um, gets to the issue of the, if any of you who've sailed a boat in coastal Maine probably know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you haven't been there, you can't, it's hard to actually capture in a photo or describe the sheer number of buoys that are everywhere. And we don't think that this ropeless fishing is, we expect coastal Maine to be actually the last place where ropeless fishing actually takes place. But um, there are other areas where lobstermen are deploying buoys and in the, in the, arrangement that I previously referred to as trawls, which amounts to a daisy chain of up to 70 traps in our offshore environment, stretched often one to two miles across the seafloor bet between two end buoys. Just knowing where each other's trawls are is hard for two different lobstermen, and they rely heavily on the presence of the buoy to um, align their gear next to each other as they're fishing. Fixed gear fishers, such as trawlers and scallopers, also do not want to capture the trawls with their own gear. And it already happens a lot, even with the visuals of the buoys in the environment. 
Um, and that's already, as I said, a significant amount of gear conflict. And initial fears are that by removing the traditional buoy marking, this from as their surface position, this could get worse. On the flip side, one physics advantage that has already emerged from our early testing is that our fishermen collaborators have been tested, have discovered that unlike fishing gear that has a buoy anchoring it to its surface that can get caught by a trawler or get drug in a storm or by a whale, um, they're finding that ropeless gear tends to be exactly where they left it on the bottom. So that's one positive advantage that we're already discussing, discovering in early testing. Gear conflict issues, as previously mentioned, um, continue. Um, acoustically tagged gear is playing a big role in our long-term solution. By having the gear acoustically tagged, this facilitates the data streams that are needed to essentially build what, build what we are envisioning to essentially be the Google traffic maps of the ocean floor. The cons to this are obviously cost, social change, um, getting fishermen that have, you know, often leave the port without even having an echo sounder or a, or a chart plotter or a GPS on their boats um, now need to basically have that technology. Most of our offshore fishermen where, where we target, have a higher priority for targeting this um, already do have most of this technology, um, but it will require support and adoption, not just by our fixed gear fishing fleets, but our mobile gear fishing fleets as well. The pros here, which is that mobile fishing gear, which were previously needed, the, either the buoy had to have a radar reflector on it, um, otherwise fisher, mobile fishermen could only see buoys in, in good light conditions. Um, and you know, so during daytime when there wasn't fog and there weren't storms. Um, also, so we expect a, a side benefit to the, be a re reduction in the amount of lost or ghost gear, which should have economic savings for, for both less gear damage for mobile fishermen as well as fixed gear fishermen. Um, it should also um, increase the accountability for um, what does occur out there, which is negligent destruction of gear. Essentially, if all the gear is tagged um, and, and there's an acoustic pinger on it, and the next time a boat with a transponder happens to drive within one two, to two kilometers of it, that gear should be able, we envision a future where that gear would basically be able to send a signal to that boat um, where it its new position is then uploaded in the database and the fisherman would get an email saying, hey, your gear has been found and it's now at this position. Also, we're discovering that the ability of any vessel to see the orientation of a specific trawl gives it the ability to decipher what the orientation of that trawl is on the sea floor. As I said, some of these buoys are up of, upwards of two miles apart. And so the fishermen often can't see where the other end of a trawl is. And now this would, they would have that ability. There are many places where ropeless fishing can already occur in New England waters and or will be able to with proposed policy actions that were just released and or are pending. Currently, it's possible to apply for an experimental fishing permit to trial ropeless fishing gear in any non-closed area. And there are several proposed rule changes that provide language that would allow for harvest to occur in existing and future closed areas provided fishermen use ropeless fishing technology, as well as allow for the use of ropeless fishing technology without surface buoys in open areas where it's currently prohibited. So our roadmap for how we think ropeless fishing is going to evolve and play out. Um, in the last few years, we've been focused on establishing ro ropeless testing areas, funding the industry to test collaborative development. So we basically have a fund where we will reimburse fishermen for their time and effort to work on testing the gear with us. And then we also put technical observers and trainers on their vessels to help them. And then fishermen are provide are truly lead, fishermen are truly leading um, the gear conflict solutions. Um, we have participants from now both the mobile and fixed gear fisheries working on this with us, as well as we've conducted a NASA technology search to find every possible vendor out there that might be able to produce some element element of ropeless fishing technology from the acoustic transponders to the release devices. And this has basically helped in already starting to bring down costs as, as basically market competition enters into the game. And then it also by us developing a roadmap, it's the agency has been signaling an investment opportunity and production um, expansion needs to the vendors. And we're working on producing a, a more formal roadmap document that we expect to release by the spring of 2022. Over the next few years, we plan to tailor development 
of rootless technology to emerging management policy decisions, as well as expanding our testing of the gear geolocation technologies, as well as developing management data infra the data management infrastructure that will be needed to support this Google Maps per se of the seafloor. We think that it's very likely that we'll be able to operationalize ropeless fishing to the scale that is necessary by 2025 in our federal waters. So this is our waters outside of the three mile zone and begin the implement. And with that gear conflict is, a, it's the easiest area for a gear conflict because while the most dangerous gear is in the federal waters, the gear density is the lowest out there. Um, so we expect that the gear geolocation solutions should be come operational by 2025. And by 2030, we think that it may be actually possible for ropeless technology will have evolved sufficiently to fish in the higher density coastal areas as well. Shifting gears, the other part of the right whale challenge is obviously vessel strikes. Um, and where the agency is also working very aggressively on this. Here's just some of the management processes that we have in place or seasonal management areas where there are mandatory um, 10 knot speed restrictions for vessels greater than 65 feet in length along the East Coast, as well as dynamic management areas and slow zones. Currently, these are voluntary, um, that they're triggered whenever a right whale is seen by a, either a visual or acoustic detection. Um, for the in the northeast acoustic detections are used and as well as there have been significant efforts to correct uh, vessel routing measures which basically has amounted to changing shipping lanes so if right whales are suddenly start using an area that is a current shipping lane in the past we've actually moved the primary shipping lane um, to ensure um, to minimize the interaction rate between the whales and vessels so for the past 30 minutes or more, um, I've been covering kind of what consumes most of my day job. But there's a question I've been asked repeatedly in my work on protected species, whether it was monk seals, coho salmon, um, or right whales. And it takes many forms, but especially for those who are less di diplomatic, it comes down to the most blunt version is why bother? Stopping climate change, slowing population growth, are all such daunting challenges that those of us facing these challenges every day, for those of us facing these challenges, entirely new psychoses have been defined in the sciences, including climate change fatigue, conservation exhaustion, and the public is pumped full of statistics of doom from conservation levels rising above a certain level X or temperatures get warmer than Y, the world or end. It's hard for their head, for them to wrap their heads around these issues. But what I've started seeing is if you tell them a story about something like tomorrow there will be no more right whales named dragon, that's something the public seems to be able to grasp. And if you'll allow my digression to zoom out here, um, I want to talk to you about what has been the single greatest threat. And this is another um, video where the dial on this is supposed to be counting to give you a sense of the speed at which human population growth is occurring. Um, during the course of just this seminar, roughly 7,000 humans are going to die, but another 16,000 are going to be born and the human population will have increased by 9,000. The incredible irony of the past year and a half is I created this slide initially in February 20th of 2020, right as we were, the world was really beginning to recognize the threats of COVID. Since then, the new population estimate on this same counter is now close to 7 billion, 800 million people. And the global population since the start of COVID has increased by 158 million people. And two and a half years ago, my wife and I contributed this number as well. Um, for those of you who knew what my thesis was at, at Moss Landing, there's a little sort of um, um, egg, uh, Easter egg here in the picture um, to that. Um, and, and we're debating number two for our, for our own family and the guilt between being raised as an Irish, Irish Catholic and now a, a evolutionary ecologist who works for a marine conservation agency, recognizing the impact everything that we deal with at the National Marine Fishery Service ultimately comes back to human population growth. What does 8 billion people mean? It's a staggering number that most people 
can't begin to wrap their heads around. So I'd like to step away from Wales for a bit and considering some staggering statistics. And just thinking about the terrestrial environment 10,000 years ago with the dawn of agriculture, humanity composed less than 1% of the terrestrial mammalian biomass. It's been estimated that we and our livestock now can pose 98% of the terrestrial mammalian biomass. When you think about that in terms of marine mammals, we're actually probably doing better in ma aquatic mammal conservation than we are in, in terrestrial mammal conservation. Um, but fundamentally, human needs haven't changed. We still need food, water, and shelter. What has changed is the definition of shelter in the last 10,000 years. That now means everyone wants a physical home and we want energy to, um, to keep that home warm and connect us to the internet. And, and the reality is, is defense plays a huge part of our, our, our mindset. We like to think that we aren't part of it or not engaging in it, but it, it plays a significant role in human needs these days. Today, um, there are 118 million humans living along the East Coast of the United States. And globally, the population is expected to reach 10 billion by 2050. Our resource demands are huge already and growing. In the past 20 years of my NIMS career, I've seen conflict between one of our, some animal in our marine resource portfolio and every picture on this screen. Our objective is always simple. It's balance ecosystems with consumption. The solutions are always less simple. When challenges emerge with these resource uses, they often impact the public through the lens of charismatic organisms like right whales or salmon. And as they become endangered, they emerge as the proverbial canary in the coal mine. We are going to need the ocean to feed us and support our coastal communities and economies and meet our energy demands at a higher level to save us than has ever been considered in the past. There are no way terrestrial resources can support humanity's continued growth and is in order, is in order but in order for the ocean to meet those needs and resources, it will be necessary to maintain the continuum vital functions that we depend on in the ocean. And therefore we will need solutions for coexistence. These solutions will ultimately be technical and policy in orientation, but at least in a society based on democratic processes, in order to convince the public to buy into those solutions, there will need to be social links to these issues that the technical solutions will be too abstract for much of the public to, or average person to grasp as they're struggling to do things like pay bills or simply make sure their kid gets home safe from college. And that gets into this question of why we need to save right whales. And this is where I'm really transitioning from the technical to the more philosophical element of the talk. Many of you are probably engaged in the concept of, of keystone species um, having a great effect on their ecosystem. Um, and without them, the ecosystem changes or suffers. And, and great work has been done on this as in marine, large marine mammals. Uh, and I, I really have spent a lot of time in the last couple of years thinking about the work by Roman and McCarthy that initiated this idea of the whale pump and that others have expanded upon since then. Um, these animals display cris critical functioning critical roles in functioning ocean ecosystems and climate change recovery. Great talks have been given on the concept of the whale pump. Whales are crucial links to the nutrient cycling, both vertically in the ocean ecosystem, as well as horizontally moving areas from high productivity to low productivity with their large migrations. As they dive to depths and forage on plankton, fish and squid, they return to the surface and to breathe. And when they do, they poop a lot. Um, and they contribute um, nitrogen, carbon, and iron to the surface layer. So much so, in fact, in fact, that even the depleted whale population in the Northeast is estimated to contribute more nitrogen to the surface of the ocean than all of the rivers in New England do could together. And it gets better. One of the a more recent sort of back, back of the envelope calculation estimates that one whale's lifetime carbon absorption is as many as 2000 trees. And that pencils out um, in a recent economic analysis to put the value of one whale on the carbon trading map markets at around $2 million. 
In my agency and in many science institutions, we're struggling to move past the concept of single species focus to a more ecosystem-based approach as a way to understand and quantify moving processes. My colleague, Jason Link, uh, created this map of the Northeast food web to establish the connectivity between, in the map he used, I think roughly 70 and considered a couple hundred species. This is important and necessary to anticipate and plan for future changes in our ecosystems as we are dependent upon everything for food, everything from food and energy to oxygen from the ocean. But even Jason acknowledges many scientists have difficulty comprehending this connectivity. So for most people to understand connections through the ecosystems, there is a need to communicate through those species that they feel connections with. And these are the species that inspire each of us to act. In many respects, they are our environmental conscious. Time and again, as I've worked on protected species, I have seen communities act to save a species like a salmon or a whale. In some way, these animals challenge us to save something that we need. Even when we can't be bothered to save a process for ourselves, more often than not, we will act to do it for them. And it's because of that, I've come to think of these animals are in, as our environmental conscious. By example, the development of offshore wind in the Atlantic and as well as the Gulf of Mexico and projections for the Pacific, um, just in the mid-Atlantic, we were planning to convert 1.7 million acres of pelagic habitat to reef to support wind farm development in the next decade. That does not include the Gulf of Mexico or Gulf of Kepner or the Gulf of Maine or the West Coast, which will include probably multiple million more acres. I firmly believe that offshore wind is necessary technology to address the greater challenges faced um, and created by our carbon-based energy system. And in reality, most of my agency's protected species portfolio ultimately face climate change as their greatest threat. So we know we need these solutions. But what has happened time and again as we're developing and facing and figuring out how to manage right offshore wind in the, in the Northeast of the 200 species that are connected to the Northeast food web or more than 200 species, right whales are the single, have the single strongest seed at the table acting as the shield for all the other species, um, creating the political pressure to ensure that development happens in a more thoughtful and sustainable way. And I clicked fast there. Viewing things on a larger time scale, I've been giving a lot of thought to this recent paper, a recent paper by Kempel et al, um, comparing the future of aquaculture and commercial fishing. This paper discussed a history, starts with a question of the history of the terrestrial transition from our hunter-gatherer societies to an agricultural society, and then evolves into to a scenario planning exercise that envisions four possible futures and suggests a similar future of terraforming of the ocean, which two of the four scenarios see no future for commercial fishing at all. Um, something that is unfathomable today, especially for an agency that calls itself the National Marine Fisheries Service. But remembering that 10 billion human population at, by 2050 mid-century number, we will be desperate for protein and energy um, and something that the offshore environment promises to support. It will be considerations of species like the right whale, both their keystone contributions to the ecosystem with the whale bump and other processes, as well as their social firewall as a keystone management species. I believe that society gives them and it gives me the faith that makes them the right whale for ensuring things are done in a sustainable method. There are many important roles to be played in facing our global future or our future global challenges from science to policy to politics and social. Among those are the role of the storyteller. And it is they who create the meaningful connections that inspire people to act. Over the past 20 years, I've had the privilege to work on many species with deep social connections to their region and could likely have given a very similar presentation about any of those other species. But today's story was about right whales in New England. This is our last picture of Dragon, who I've told her story throughout the presentation. Her story is not done being told. 
Um, and in the end, it may be that stories like hers are the ones that save us. And with that, I'll stop the presentation and take questions. Thank you so much. Um, so just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to use the reactions tab and raise your hand and you can, we'll unmute you and you can uh, turn on your video to ask your question. Hey, Sean, thank you. That was a great talk. I really enjoyed it, uh, it was fascinating. Um, I had a question about uh, that 10-year uh, plan for implementing ropeless fishing gear. Um, is there a price tag associated with that 10-year plan? And uh, how much of that money will go to defray the costs of commercial fishermen from switching from their current gear to this ropeless fishing technology? Yeah, the, we have, a, we have a, an economic analysis of that that we're about to release. Um, and um, it'll be released at the um, North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium meeting at the end of October. So it's it's currently sort of going through peer review. And, and I mentioned those seven lawyers that we write with all the time. Nothing gets released by, we maintain 100% scientific integrity on our, on our right whale science, but because of the sensitivity of the issue, um, you know, we, we haven't released that number yet. So I don't want to answer, give you a, a dollar value to the, to the decimal point, but it's, it's a big price tag. Um, but we, through the, I can say that the, the economic analysis considers just um, economic models of the scaling costs of technology. So, you know, the current, just sort of ballparking that the current price tag of some of these units is on the order of, you know, several thousand dollars for a single unit and fishermen are theoretically going to need dozens, if not more units per vessel to deploy their current array of traps. Um, but the economic analysis um, suggests that, you know, those prices are also kind of envisioning like the capacity of those are iPhone prices in 1990 dollars, right? So, you know, in the 10 to 20 year scenario, it will still be expensive as, as we're sort of moving towards a long-term plan. And, and the price tag will be much more than 10 years. You know, this is probably 10, 20, 30 years before, you know, we might have a, a full global conversion of, of this. Um, but it's very likely that some mixture of private philanthropy, you know, government contributions and, and costs are, are going to play a role. The other thing that is happening, though, is, is going to be market pressure. Um, so, New England lobster has already had several down gate grades on the on the uh, on the Monterey Bay Aquarium Fish Watch list, and we're already have had um, several contacts from um, both food supply chain, you know, representatives of companies like Whole Foods wanting a whale safe product, and so we suspect that there will also just be an economic incentive to fish ropelessly as well. But it will require change and patience. Awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, Karen. Hi, Sean, thanks. That was an amazing talk. Um, you know, I just want to make a comment and then I have a question. I am so glad to hear you talk about human overpopulation. I start every one of my classes by talking about it. And I can't understand why it's not on the front page of CNN every single day. So thank you for bringing, refocusing our attention on that. I think it's the number one most important conservation concept that humans can consider. Um, so my question's a little bit, um, might be out there, but my kid is uh, in college as a naval architect. And I'm wondering if you know anything about, um, are there ship designs or things that people should start thinking about that could address ship strikes? Or, I don't know anything about it. You know, he's a freshman. He's just taking physics. Yeah, it's a really good question. So we're actually working with. Um, there's a we're one of the faculty we're working with is actually a naval engineer at Annapolis. Um, more on our, our ropeless and aquaculture technology solutions. Um, but getting to your more specific question of ship designs, it's a tough one. Um, Hui has actually made a, a good bit of progress on basically an infrared camera system that can see blows. You know, obviously, we're, most of our designs for high-speed, you know, 
currently we're relying on going slow and human observers to avoid um, the animal. But I can't tell you how many times I've been on a NOAA vessel with completely encircled by professional mammal observers and we've had a whale pop up next to the boat, right? Like it's just, it's a very, that is fallible um, and, and will be. And so we need alternative technologies. And so the design is, you know, I think the idea of infrared camera systems that are gonna be able to detect blows, you know, through AI sensories are, are one thing. I think ultimately probably committing to go, going slow is going to be another thing. There's been, you know, thought about acoustic detections. The problem is ships are, are noisy themselves and, you know, are, are essentially masking their own ability to hear animals. It may be that the advent of, you know, and I'm going to get whimsical right back at you here, the, the advent of, of electric powered ships, um, may both reduce the sort of the noise stress for animals in the future, as well as the um, potential um, um, ability to sort of listen more, um, you know, for animals. But, you know, right whales, you know, don't always make sound. And so we can't be dependent on a, a vocalizing animal. Um, there's been discussion of sort of emitting some sort of deterrent signal, but when you actually look at the sheer scale of vessels, you know, the Lloyds of London holds the insurance registry for most of the vessels on the planet. And just the large vessels, there's on, you know, you're talking about 30,000 vessels. And if you wanted to sort of create some sort of deterrent noise, you'd suddenly insonify the ocean with something that would just chase the animals, you know, make things even worse for them on a stress level. Mm -hmm. So, but, um, you know, at the same time, you know, Tesla was just a, a concept 10 years ago, right? And self-driving cars. And so I, I have faith in technology. That's been, I think, one of the things I've kind of, if in some small way helped accelerate in New England is having, you know, sort of grown up as a scientist on the periphery of Silicon Valley. I've, I've been able to bring a little bit more of a technology, yes, we can change mindset, I think. Um, you know, others, I can't take full credit for that, but I've definitely been a proponent of, you know, solution through innovation and technology, so. Cool, thanks so much, Sean. All right, uh, Lauren, Oops, I just muted you again, my bad. Thanks, Shelby. Um, that was a really fascinating talk, Sean. I was just wondering kind of on a personal level, how you handle kind of the emotions that come when working with what I would kind of view as like a really depressing um, situation and kind of working with these animals that are trending towards extinction. I find it hard just like, I feel emotional watching your talk and reading papers about North Atlantic right whales. So what is that like on kind of a daily basis? Yeah, so I, I started my career on Hoi and Monk Seals with nymphs, went to CCC Coho in Santa Cruz, just north of you, and, and I've been asked the sort of the question of, you know, why bother throughout my um, career? And I, I regularly make the comment that I can't do my job without being an eternal optimist. Um, and, you know, and, and there is sort of an element of you have to decouple yourself. I feel I grew up on a, a, a farm in, in upstate New York. And, you know, and, and the reason I'm not a farmer is because I couldn't handle the sort of the daily, daily decisions of, of harvesting livestock. I, you know, I loved the lifestyle, but I, you know, emotionally that was hard, but at the same time, I personally, I, I think it, it helped me kind of build a, a bit of an emotional firewall to, to remain sort of keep my eye on the long-term goal. You know, there are moments where we all kind of tear up when when we get some story about Dragon and, and there's photos we have that are even worse that, you know, we just don't even release to the public. You know, they're just so horrific, you know, and and you have to kind of take a step back and and then actually use that to sort of fuel your, your motivation to, to sort of keep going on this change. Um, it is something that I struggle with. It's something my staff struggle with. I have four or five staff that I think can recognize, you know, 80 to 90% of the population on site, you know, so for them, when an animal dies, you know, my aerial survey crew in particular, when an animal is injured or hurt, this is an animal that they essentially have a relationship with, right? Like they've been watching this animal out of an airplane for, or off of the side of a boat for, for 20 years. And so when one of them shows up entangled, which is inevitable, um, 
you know, that that's harder for them. And so it's, you know, in part, you know, I try and prop them up as well. It, it is tough. Um, the flip side, though, is this strength. What I have discovered is that the more trouble the animal gets in at the population level, the stronger that species influence is at the societal level. So things like um, endangered, you know, steelhead in the Columbia River Basin and right whales in New England, um, you know, the amount of resources that go into making sure they make it, um, you know, at all costs, um, it gives me faith that, you know, society um, will do the right thing. I often think of the, the Winston Churchill quote, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other pass possibility. And, and that remains true to this day. But, um, you know, as these, I've, you know, we're at the point with many of these species where we are exhausting all the other possibilities. And, and that is where suddenly, because of right whales, ropeless fishing um, becomes reality. And, and not just reality for right whales. You guys are dealing with this on the West Coast with gray whales and humpbacks. And it's not a population crisis there so much as it is an animal welfare crisis now, but it will be if it doesn't get um, resolved. Um, and so um, it, it's the benefit that these species as they're suffering the most are, are benefiting so many others um, um, on a broad level that I just try and make sure to maintain that optimism. But it's not easy. Great, thank you. Looks like Jack has another question. Yeah, hey, sorry, thanks, Sean. Um, I did have another question. So I was just curious, uh, you, this your like that's 10 year plan is directed at commercial fishing efforts, right? Or is it commercial and recreational? Uh, sorry, um, I just visited with my screen. It's, um, that is um, primarily a commercial fishing in New England effort, yes. Um, so how do you envision, like, I guess it transferring to the recreational fishermen as well and stuff like here on the West Coast with Dungeness crab fisheries being yeah. like, you know, sort of primary source of entanglements. Uh, I know we have a ton of recreational Dungeness crab fishermen and it just seems unfeasible, you know, that they're going to be able to afford these things. Uh, and like you were saying, maybe that is part of the 10, 20, 30 year sort of plan. But I was just curious how recreational fishing fits in as well. It's, you know, it's. On the East Coast, it's less of an issue because the right whale issue is currently ecologically more outside the, the zone of most of the recreational fishing issues. Species like minke whales and whatnot, there's greater risk of some recreational entanglement, but it's, it's not the situation where you have you know, the dramatic ecosystem and, and fish population changes that you've had in the California current where you now have, you know, humpbacks moving from foraging on sardines offshore to anchovies inshore, right? You know, you know, right in, you know, um, you know, I remember 2015 and 2016 were bad years. <laughs> yeah. And I was, you know, I was at the Santa Cruz lab and, you know, and watching, you know, paddle boarders, you know, in and around humpbacks at steamers lane, you know, in, in 2014, 2015 and, and seeing that. So the, the short answer is it's just, if it's ever feasible, it's going to be longer, um, you know, and it, and it may be that society will make some choice at that level. You know, it may be that they're going, there's going to be some sort of allowable mortality for recreational versus, and I'm speculating wildly here. I don't know the answer to your question. Um, but I, I do think just like, you know, you know, I, my graduate career started, um, you know, I think Google was created the same year I started graduate school, right? And email started when I was an undergrad, right? And so, you know, and the idea of uh, having one of these devices that I have access, you know, the, the, it, it is the mythical equivalent to the Star Trek tricorder, right? It can't heal anyone, but it does have our entire access global database essentially right here, right? Um, that didn't exist when I was starting 20 years ago. So I, I suspect the, economic scaling of technology with time will will have a huge benefit to that. But, you know, the idea, it, it's something that most people can't wrap their heads. It's too abstract today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions? 
Well, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so I guess my biggest question is you talked about trying to engage anglers or fishermen into the program um, through monetary values. Is, do you have any other programs or ways that you actively engage anglers or fishermen to try to like educate them about these different activities? Yeah. So one, you know, we, I've got a, an entire gear research team that, you know, is their focus of communication is, is with fishermen. And it's a very, you know, my, they have actually gotten a lot of um, sort of skepticism from our more academic communities because they're not writing papers and they're not doing this they're not doing right. You know, writing a paper and publishing it in science or nature on this, as far as saving right whales is a waste of time. <laughs> You're, that's, you know, it's great. It's preaching to the choir and in the academic community that we're doing something. But if you really wanna make change, you know, go hang out on a dock and talk to fishermen. And so I've, you know, I, I fill out as many travel orders. I, you know, had approved a travel order for one of my guys who, you know, two years ago, we said Maine, Maine was like, no one in Maine will ever do this. And I just had a, you know, staff drop off, you know, dozens of lobster traps from Southern Maine all the way to Lebec in the Northeast corner of, of Maine just in the last couple of days. And, you know, we have, you know, fishermen signing up regularly, um, you know, so we pay them. We also are absorbing all the costs of the equipment. So we basically have what's called a gear library. Um, so we basically are signing out gear to them as fast as they'll take it. Um, and, and basically saying, encouraging them to bring it back broken. Um, we want them to test it as hard and we don't want this stuff. You know, these are some, in some, 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 some of the technologies of, they could go out and buy it today if they wanted and others are prototypes that we paid 10 grand for. And, and we want, we don't want any of it babied, you know, break it, bring it back broken, tell us why it didn't work and tell us how to make it better um, is, is one avenue of communication and then finish from and communicate by word of mouth. Um, and so, um, having that sort of trust and confidence and, and faith with the industry, um, is one thing we are actually in the process of building several videos. Um, and if you guys want, I can show you some video, video footage of the, um, just the sort of the early trials. I, I do have, I could go back to screen, screen share to do that. And we've actually just in the last couple of days started to reach out to, would you be willing to be part of a, an, un, a, a NOAA video where you're asked, you know, you know, straight up questions, what do you think? And, and we, you know, we'll commit to, you know, sort of putting your answers out there, you know, as part of the community. But, you know, the, what we've discovered with fishermen is that the more experience they have with the gear, the more confidence they have in the feasibility. There's, um, you know, and the more education there is, the more um, confidence there is. Um, so we've been working really hard, you know, softly through word of mouth and, and trying not to have the the big brother. We're from NIMPS and we're a bunch of scientists and engineers and we're going to tell you why you're going to do this better. And, you know, we really, really avoid that message at all costs, you know, and really try and just make it so that it's economically worth their while to, to try it. Also just, you know, the reality is the fishermen are, I've often found to be the greatest stewards of the sea, right? And so they, you know, there's a lot of I never saw this, I never happened. But the reality is, you know, we all know it happens out there. Um, if it's not happening there, it's happening somewhere else. And statistically is the other thing is, you know, from, from the fisherman's perspective, they could go generations without ever entangling a whale in a family, right? But, you know, it's, you know, there's 2 million lines out there, but there's only 360 right whales, you know? So, you know, it, it's the right whale probability that's the the lottery. You know, it's the the rare fisherman that actually ever has an entanglement event. So from them, it's almost an impossible thing that never happens, but they know it happens, and and they don't want it to happen either. So as they're just seeing the writing on the wall that you know that fishing mortality is part of the problem, they are coming to us. They want to be part of the solution, and we're working really hard to just help them do that. All right. Well, if we have any more questions, I'm sure Sean is happy to answer them. If not, I think we will let you go because I know it's getting late there. Um, but thank you so much for your talk. It was really great.